The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Seat Belts and School Transport Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have. The bill is amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 7A, the marshalled list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshal list of amendments to which we now turn. And I turn to group one, commencement of section one duty and I call amendment one in the name of Gillian Martin, group with amendment two. Gillian Martin, please to move amendment one and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, the legislative measures in this bill have been arrived at using a partnership approach. The Scottish Government and I have consulted and listened. I'm sure to all of us in the Chamber the term school transport appears like a straightforward phrase which does exactly what it says on the tin. However, as myself and I'm sure the members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee can attest to, this is a deceptively nuanced area with various overlapping factors and delivery bodies. I will let the Minister for Transport and the Islands outline in more detail the significant engagement the Scottish Government undertook during the devolution of powers which allowed the introduction of this bill. Yet it's fair to say that collaboration has been key to ensuring the legislative proposals are practical and fit for purpose. What we hear loud and clear was that a phased approach to introduction was necessary. It became apparent that it would take longer for councils to adapt and absorb the changes in relation to secondary school transport. In general, more double-decker buses are used in this area, exactly the type of vehicle without seatbelts that this legislation is aimed at targeting. That is why Scottish Ministers announced implementation dates of 2018 for primary school transport and 2021 for secondary schools. School authorities have been working towards these timescales time and councils have signed contracts based on them in good faith. At stage two, we were aware that accelerating implementation dates for secondary provision could lead to contracts having to be broken or renegotiated. Inevitably, this will lead to significant practical and financial, as well as potentially legal, consequences. We have now canvassed local government and it is clear that five councils find themselves in such a situation. Presiding Officer Falkirk Council, Glasgow City Council, West Lothian Council, Stirling Council and Click Manager Council have all signed <coughs> contracts beyond 2018. Given the lack of precedent with having to renegotiate or break and retender such contracts, it is not straightforward to forecast cost implications. However, we are aware that this will have stark and troublesome ramifications for those concerned. Over this bill's parliamentary passage, we have listened to the views of MSPs that cost forecasts regarding other elements were too high. As such, the Scottish Government helped to prepare the Supplementary Financial Memorandum, which helps address these concerns and places a formal review period to help mitigate costs. Therefore, to accelerate commencement dates and force such uncertain and problematic consequences does not seem necessary or sensible to me, especially in times of challenging resources for local government. Whilst I absolutely understand the motivation for implementing these safety measures for young people as quickly as possible, it is incumbent on us to be mindful of the wider backdrop. That is why I'm moving Amendment 2 today to allow for a long stop date for commencement in 2021 for school authorities which have entered into such contracts. <coughs> this amendment is to specifically address the issues I have outlined rather than being intended to offer any sort of catch-all exemption for such school authorities. As such, it has been deliberately drafted as narrowly as possible to allow regulations on commencement to make only a limited exception to the general 2018 commencement agreed to at stage two. Members may remember that we listened to the views of Parliament on the importance of the legal requirement covering vehicles used for school trips and my amendment on this gained approval at stage two. As such, under my amendments today, vehicles used for school excursions will would still be subject to the 2018 commencement date. The exemption here only applies to home to school transport. 
This amendment would not allow school authorities to enter into further contracts beyond the date on which this bill receives royal assent, which do not meet the le new legal requirement in section one of the bill to have seatbelts fitted. So there is no possible loophole for school authorities here, and the exemption only relates to pre-existing contracts at royal assent. Furthermore, the amendment only relates to transport for secondary school provision, meaning that provision for primary school transport will not be exempt and therefore will be subject to the accelerated 2018 commencement date. Consequentially, Amendment 1 reinstates the term secondary education in the list of de definitions within the bill taken from the Education Scotland Act 1980. To sum up, members may remember the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's own Stage 1 report endorsed the commencement dates which were originally committed to for the bill as, and I quote, reasonable and practicable. And now that we know the blatant implications of this for a number of local authorities, there seems even more compelling case for that approach and for phased commencement of the bill. However, with that phasing has been carefully limited as I have described, and with an ultimate deadline of 2021 in order to respect the decision which this Parliament took at stage two. Presiding officer, I move amendments one and two. Thank you. You just need to move amendment one. We're not dealing with amendment two yet. I've got uh, four members wanting to come in. I'll call you Mike Rumbles, followed by John Finney, followed by Peter Chapman, followed by Edward Mountain. Mike Rumbles, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, throughout the first two stages of this bill, when both officials and the minister appeared uh, to the committee, I and other members of the committee repeatedly asked how many local authorities already had contracts in place to ensure that our school children travelled to and from school in buses with seatbelts. Throughout the course of, course of stages one and two, the necessary detail information was not forthcoming until now. Now we find that five local authorities have contracts with transport providers that have not insisted that seat belts are fitted. These contracts run, we are told, until the 31st of August 2021. This lack of detailed information from the Scottish Government led some of us on the committee to believe that this bill might actually not be necessary at all. I certainly couldn't understand why the Scottish Government couldn't provide us with this information before now. As it turns out, this bill is indeed very necessary as are these two amendments uh, Julian Martin has tabled because five councils out of the 32 have been far too slow to act. The last thing we want to see is these five councils being held liable for what would be illegal contracts if these two amendments are not passed. For this reason, therefore, I can confirm that the Liberal Democrats support Julian Martin's amendments, but it is a poor show that this information was not made known to members considering this, this bill in committee at stage two. Thank you. John Finney, followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We don't live in a perfect world. If we lived in a perfect world, we wouldn't need this legislation. This legislation is very pragmatic, as are the particular amendments one and two. As my colleague Mike Rumble said, they are very necessary. And I, I think it is a transition. There is nothing to stop, and hopefully uh, uh, operators will um, fit seatbelts. But this, this is pragmatic, and I know it's significantly that uh, the, the exclusion of primary pupils. So uh, we'll certainly be supporting it at decision time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Chapman, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am glad that at stage two, my amendment to bring forward the date for requirement for seat belts in secondary school buses was agreed. However, this amendment by Gillian Martin today falls short of my intentions at stage two, and I think it is right and proper that all school transport, irrespective of contracts, has seat belts fitted by the end of 2018. We accept that there may be contracts which run before, which have been in, in place before August 20, and run into August 2021, and that they may, may have to be adjusted. But we believe there need to be, there need not be many, and a small price to pay for the sake of school children's safety and parents' peace of mind. There is 8.9 million set aside in this bill's financial memorandum, and we believe this is an ample amount for the additional cost implications of changes to existing contracts with bus companies. And we believe for these reasons that this amendment impedes the progress of ensuring seatbelts are compulsory on secondary school transport by the end of 2018. So we will be voting against this amendment for these reasons. Edward Mountain followed by Rhoda Grant. Presiding officer, thank you. I also find myself in the same place as Peter Chapman, unable to support Gillian Martin's amendment. Two, 
During the committee scrutiny, we heard that the financial cost of the bill was estimated and would be paid to local authorities without being ring-fenced or accounted for individually. It appears that from the evidence we have recently received that only five of the 32 councils have not got seat belts fitted on secondary transport. That means that 27 councils who have actually gone the whole hog and had seat belts fitted will be penalised uh, or not seen to have done as well as they have done because five, people, five councils haven't performed. Now, it appeared to me when questioning the member what the actual cost for ensuring school transport, sorry, the actual cost for ensuring seatbelts on school transport for secondary schools will be. As we've heard from Mr Chapman, it will be 8.9 million that's been set aside. I would dearly give way to the, to the member if she could explain exactly what the cost for is in each of those five authorities so I can understand that. Uh, can I give way? Uh, yes, it's up to the member. You either give way and do your wind up, but do give way if you I wish, Julie Martin. I'm happy to give way to you. You're asking about the cost. I'm not going to be able to answer that. But what I have to clarify with you is you're saying that only five councils don't have contracts with seatbelts. That's not the case. We're talking about five councils who would have to break their contracts, their current contracts before 2021. There's actually only at the moment tw 24 councils that actually have contracts in place that have, have stipulated having seatbelts. So I think there's been a little bit of confusion here. We're talking about five councils which would have to break a contract in order to fulfil Mr Chapman's amendment at stage two. Stage two. Edward Mountain. Um, I, I do thank the member for that answer, but this is the problem that we've met right the way through the scrutiny. No exact cost can be given. You, you've been unable to give me a cost today. And, you know, if I pushed you, how many of those councils, of those five councils, have entered into contracts since this bill was first muted? I have to say, uh, presiding officer, as a parent, I cannot agree to the delay in the provision of seatbelts on secondary school transport a moment longer than we have to. And I don't believe the people of Scotland will go away this afternoon and understand that transport sorry, seatbelts on school transport for secondary schools will be delayed a moment longer than it needs to. I have to say, God forbid that we have an accident involving secondary pupils in 2019 and the bus didn't have seat. I'm sorry, you, you may sigh, but I actually feel this personally and I feel it very that people of Scotland will feel the same things that I'm feeling on this. So please don't mock me for an honest opinion. Please don't mock me. So, therefore, I cannot support Gillian's amend uh, Gillian Martin's amendment because I couldn't live with myself if any accidents happened because seatbelts weren't fitted. Thank you. Rhoda Grant, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I think we all agree that this bill is a good thing and that seatbelts should be fitted on school buses as soon as possible. However, I, we are concerned that if this amendment were not passed, it would mean financial penalties to councils. And I wonder if the Scottish Government would sit down with the five councils concerned and their contractors to see if they can have seatbelts fitted earlier than the contract currently allows, if there was goodwill on both sides. So I'd ask the Scottish Government to take that forward. Therefore, unless we can guarantee that financial assistance would be made available to the councils involved, we would... We... Jamie Green. It would, uh -huh. Thank you. Yes. Your microphone was. Pardon me. Uh, thank you again for taking the intervention. Um, is, is it our understanding that the current uh, financial memorandum, uh, the numbers that have been given to us in the Rural Economy Committee, include or exclude the potential cost of the breaking of these contracts? Because it's entirely unclear to us, I think. Rhoda Grant. The evidence we received in committee that the money in the financial memorandum was to be distributed to councils under the normal formula, which meant that those who already had been proactive and fitted seatbelts to school transport were not going to be unduly penalised compared to councils who had um, decided not to do that at an early date. So I don't think I could suggest that councils who hadn't done this would get financial assistance, that other councils who had already made that decision would do. And neither could we impose further cuts on councils who are already fitting, um, are already forced to cut services because of austerity. So therefore, reluctantly, we agree with the amendment because I think it's a pragmatic way forward while pushing for earlier resolution to this. Thank you. Call the Minister. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think, of course, as the Chamber is already aware, there is some history to the measures uh, we are debating today, as Ms Martin alluded to. Uh, they came about following the devolution of competence on the issue via uh, Section 30. Uh, order this took uh, forward aspirations first tabled uh, before this Parliament's Public Petitions Committee. And in that vein, this is a very compelling example of how a kernel of an idea has progressed through a democratic system towards uh, legislative uh, change. The Scottish Government made good use of the time taken to progress the legal and administrative uh, procedures for devolution of competence. We use that time to engage with partners and undertake appropriate groundwork to help prepare and shape measures that would, that would be workable upon implementation. As Ms Martin has already outlined, when introducing these amendments, there is no uniform model for organisation of dedicated school transport. Indeed, there is not a bespoke model of vehicles such as, for example, the iconic yellow school bus in the United States. Yet, to a large extent, it is this flexibility that makes the system work. Scotland's 32 local authorities are a diverse patchwork, so by allowing school authorities, particularly councils, to tailor their provision, they are best able to meet the needs on the ground in their particular area. Of course. Mike Rumbles. Thank you, the Minister, for taking the intervention. It's a contentious point, this, because throughout stages one and two, I and other members of the committee asked repeatedly, could we have the information on how many councils had contracts in place already and we weren't given that information for this information to come forward now at this late stage when we're finishing stage three in the on this whole process is not a satisfactory situation and i wonder if you'd reflect on that yeah yes of course, of course i will reflect on that uh, and, and and i i get the point that of course uh, he is making and look we have a good constructive relationship uh, with our partners in local authority with cosla uh, but we can't force that information uh, if it isn't uh, for forthcoming, uh, but uh, I reflect on his point that it would have been better to have had that information at stage two. I think it's a, a very valid point to, to have made, but we are in the, in the place that we're at. And we now have the information that Miss Martin uh, has provided about those five councils. Uh, provide, presiding officer, uh, this variety of provision on the ground uh, has meant that collaboration has been key to ensuring the legislative proposals are practical and fit for purpose. That's why from a very early stage, the Scottish Government undertook such close engagement with groups such as local government, the bus industry, uh, parenting and education bodies. Uh, the Seatbelt and Dedicated School Transport Working Group was established in 2014 and enabled uh, such uh, discussions. It was through that dialogue that it became clear that a phased introduction period would be a sensible and prudent approach. Uh, when my predecessor, Keith Brown, uh, announced the plans for future legislation in 2014, Ministers were clear that implementation dates of 2018 uh, would be in place for primary school transport in 2021 and for secondary school transport. We've heard from uh, Ms Martin that the, what the glaring consequences of accelerating those dates could be. Uh, looking back at the parliamentary passage of these measures, uh, one of the issues we have spent most time examining uh, and revisiting in committee sessions in this chamber is the costs. So to add in a measure which could significantly potentially drive up the financial implications seems at odds with the broad thrust, uh, of course. Jamie Green. I do thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Uh, you talk about, uh, sorry, the Minister talks about the glaring consequences of bringing forward the introduction of the legislation, uh, but no one in the Chamber has heard the specific cost associated with doing that. So we, you've identified a risk, a risk has been identified, but no cost has been associated with that risk. What is the cost? Minister. The costs are, of course, in the financial memorandum, but if he's asking specifically about the costs of breaking contracts, of course, uh, if those contracts haven't been broken, it's difficult to quantify a cost. But clearly, uh, the point that Ms Martin rightly is making, that there would be a cost. I don't know anybody who's ever you know, broken a contract and there's not been a cost attached to him. His colleagues on his left uh, and his right, of course, uh, as businessmen in their own right, if they had broken a contract in the businesses, there would be a financial implication to that. You're absolutely right to, to ask the question what that may be, but let's not break... Uh, necessarily those contracts to, to put those councils, as, as Rhoda Grant rightly said, uh, under financial uh, increase the burden. Let me make some progress, if, if I may. Uh, of course, I agree with the sentiments that have been expressed by all, including, of course, uh, Mr Chapman and uh, Mr Mountain, that all of us in this chamber would like to see these proposals implemented as quickly as is practicable. Uh, indeed, since the introduction of this bill, I've heard many people questioning why this was not law already, as John Finney uh, said in his remarks, yet we cannot ignore the practical implications uh, on, on the ground. Um, I will take forward Rhoda Grant's suggestion about whether the government can, can be involved in facilitating uh, discussions and, and, and goodwill. Uh, I would say 
would have to be wary of that in the sense that obviously the government can't renegotiate contracts and that's not what you're asking but uh, certainly if we can facilitate discussions in that regard then I don't see why the government uh, can't uh, look uh, to do that. Uh, as we've heard the, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee endorsed the plans for phased commencement uh, dates in stage one report since then uh, we've learned that there are potentially very stark consequences for the five councils uh, involved so taking together with the history of consultation with local government and industry I think there's a very compelling case here for a limited and narrow exception uh, and that is an important point it's a very limited and very narrow exception to the full uh, accelerated commencement of the bill as uh, Gillian Martin has described that's why the Scottish government strongly strongly supports these amendments Thank you. I call Julian Martin to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 1, please. Um, I move my amendment. I, I no, you're, just you wind yeah. up and then at the end of that you decide, you tell the Chamber whether you're pressing or withdrawing it. I was I trying am, to be I, helpful. I'm, 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 well, <laughs> Obviously confused and, and you. Thank you, President Officer. You'll know this is my first time doing this, so I'd like to press Amendment 1. I, I, won't, I don't need to wind up. Thank you very much. The question is, Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. And as this is the first division, it's the stage one. I suspend for five minutes.
Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote amendment number one in the name of Julian Martin is yes, 98, no, zero, abstentions, zero. That amendment is therefore agreed to. I move on to group two, promoting and assessing the wearing of seatbelts. Can you just, just settle down? Yes, I call group two, promoting and assessing the wearing of seatbelts. I call amendment three, in the name of Neil Bibby, group with amendments four, five, six, seven, and eight. Mr. Bibby, please, you know what you're doing at last to move amendment three and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank, thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, when Rhoda Grant brought forward similar amendments at stage two, her intention was to make clear who needs to promote the wearing of seatbelts by pupils on school transport. Uh, given what was thought was some uncertainty over where that part of a school's legal duty of care towards pupils should fall. Wait, no, wait a wee minute. I want to hear what Mr Bibby has to say, even if some of you don't, and that's very rude to you, Mr Bibby. Proceed. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, she, uh, Rhoda Grant was assured that although there were technical legal difficulties with the amendments as proposed, the Scottish Government did not object to the proposed changes to the bill in principle, and so we have worked with them and with Gillian Martin uh, to revise the drafting in order to answer uh, their concerns. Uh, to explain the amendments individually, Amendment 8 inserts a new section after Section 4, creating a duty on Scottish ministers to publish statutory guidance about the steps which a school authority may take to promote and to assess the wearing of seatbelts by pupils on its dedicated school transport services, and a corresponding duty on school authorities to have regard to such guidance. This would leave it to the government in consultation with school authorities to decide how best to encourage the wearing of seatbelts and to use the guidance to cite good examples of the kinds of practices and, and procedure that schools should have in place to do so. As Rhoda Grant said at stage two, it might be that the guidance could recommend that there may be monitors on buses to ensure that seatbelts are worn if resources are available, but alternatively, it might ask authorities to engage in an education programme with young people to promote the wearing of belts. In the amendments uh, as drafted at stage two, the specific word monitor was used regarding the wearing of belts, which was queried as potentially implying the need for bus monitors on each journey. So that has been replaced in both Amendments 6 and 8 with the word assess, which, as Rhoda Grant uh, suggested at Stage 2 proceedings, was what was meant in terms of school authorities uh, measuring the wearing of belts by pupils. The Minister's concerns at Stage 2 over the practicality of consulting every school authority have been remedied with a requirement to consult representative bodies before publishing the guidance. That would, for instance, include the Scottish Council of Independent Schools rather than having to consult every single independent school in Scotland. The added discretion to consult others as appropriate also means that the government has the ability to consult, amongst others, young people themselves, as the Scottish Youth Parliament made clear to the committee at stage one of the bill. It would be far more effective for young people to be proactively involved in promoting and assessing the wearing of seatbelts rather than being forced to wear them by a third party. Amendments 5 and 6 add an extra requirement to the self-reporting duty in section 4 of the bill. This section obliges school authorities to publish an annual statement on compliance with section 1 of the bill, the duty to have seatbelts fitted on dedicated school transport services. The extra requirement created by amendments 5 and 6 is that school authorities should also include information in that statement on what they have done to promote and to assess the wearing of seatbelts by pupils on their dedicated school transport. Amendments 3 and 4 and 7 are consequential amendments to rename the compliance statements as a, a seatbelt statement, since it would now cover information broader than just compliance with the bill. Presiding officer, I move Amendment 3. Thank you very much, Mr Bibby. Jamie Green, please. 
Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I should say from the outset that we will be uh, supporting the Seatbelts to School Transport Bill brought before us today. We welcome the constructive manner that's been taken in the Chamber on the issue, but also in committee uh, in the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, if I could turn specifically to the amendments laid before us by uh, Neil Bibby today, uh, I'm pleased to say that we will support them. Uh, we did consider them very carefully. Uh, and there was uh, initially some uh, reservations around some of the wording, particularly in Amendment 8, uh, if I could draw our attention to the insertion of a, a quite substantial piece of wording around the guidance on uh, the wearing of seatbelts. In particular, in Section 8 was point 2, in that a school authority must have regard to such guidance. Uh, I felt that uh, perhaps there was some weakness in the wording of that in terms of uh, what uh, specific uh, that meant for schools. What duties or additional duties would we be placing on schools themselves? Is that the teachers of the schools, the head teachers, the drivers of the buses, the monitors, senior pupils? Uh, I felt that the, whilst there was some ambiguity to that, and I'd be welcome to hear perhaps in, in the closing uh, message from Mr. Bibby if he could define what he thinks uh, or how he thinks that might manifest itself in practice. But that being said, overall, uh, we have absolutely no problem with the concept that Scottish ministers must publish uh, guidance. Uh, around the steps uh, in which schools must take around uh, promoting uh, the wearing and usage of the seat belts, which will have to be fitted as a result of the legislation. So as a result of all of the above, uh, we will be supporting all of Mr Bibby's amendments today. Thank you. Thank you. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Green Party will be supporting all Neil Bibby's um, amendments, and I think, again, likewise, it's, it's been very constructive engagement. Education is a key role in this. It's perhaps unfortunate, certainly our party's view, it's unfortunate that we couldn't include enforcement on the, uh, on the face of the bill because we don't have these powers. However, education is very important, and, and I think significantly the role that young people play for the reasons that Neil Bibby outlined. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I thank the member for bringing these amendments before the Chamber today and working with the Scottish Government um, on them. It's clear from Labour's endeavours that they share the aspirations uh, of myself and Ms Martin that schools, uh, uh, the Scotland school children should actually wear seatbelts when the Parliament has gone to the trouble of ensuring uh, they've been fitted as a matter of law. So keeping our young people safe on the journey to and from the classroom and on school excursions is not a, a partisan issue. Uh, presiding officer, I'm sure all of us in this Chamber today want the best for uh, school pupils on these journeys and the work undertaken on the amendments proposed by uh, Rhoda Grant at stage two, which uh, led to those proposed by Neil Bibby today, uh, shows how that consensus can take uh, us forward. It has been raised uh, many times uh, throughout the bill scrutiny that any legal requirement for children between three and 14 years of age to wear seat belts on larger buses and coaches is a reserved issue. We know that the Department for Transport had previously indicated a desire to transpose relevant elements of an EU directive which would create such a law. Uh, if the UK government chose to act, there would be uh, such a law. However, in the most recent correspondence I've had, the likelihood of that uh, is not uh, particularly high. However, we've been clear that the bill represents a great opportunity to raise awareness of the safety benefits of seat belts uh, and always plan to implement guidance to help facilitate that. Therefore, Scottish ministers are prepared to accept, accept the explicit requirement for them to publish such guidance created in Amendment 8. And it's right that there should be a corresponding duty on school authorities to have regards to such guidance, uh, since the issue of people's safety on transport is something which school authorities treat, uh, of course, as a matter of the utmost importance. Uh, we fully intend to engage widely in the creation of this guidance, and I believe Ms Martin will spell, it, spell this out in more detail. Therefore, the Scottish Government is willing to accept the requirements in consultation contained in Amendment 8. Uh, regarding the requirement in Amendment 6 for school authorities to publish details on the steps they are taking to promote and assess seatbelt wearing, we feel this wording is far clearer and avoids the ambiguity associated with the term monitor, which was suggested in stage two. Again, I welcome all the work that the committee has done in considering this bill and uh, particularly commend Rhoda Grant and our Labour colleagues in her willingness to work with us on reaching something that is mutually agreeable. The Scottish Government supports uh, these amendments. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I also welcome Neil Baby's uh, sentiments here and his work as well as others in his party, in particular Rhoda Grant, in helping to shape this bill. As the Transport Minister set out, the Scottish Government appears willing to accept the legal duties placed upon ministers by this group of amendments. Moving forward on that consensus, I would like to reiterate the importance of us all working together to ensure young people wear seatbelts on dedicated school transport. Whilst it may not be in the gift of this Parliament to change the law on reserve matters, we should not allow this to lessen our aspirations here. 
It's often raised that the wearing of seatbelts in cars has become second nature to youngsters. Indeed, that came through in the Scottish Government's public consultation on these measures. And we know that the habit of wearing seatbelts can be further encouraged if schools, parents and carers take an active role in promoting their use from an early age, for instance, through lessons and road safety educational events. That's why I do not see this bill as a narrow legal instrument, but rather a key piece in the wider jigsaw of road safety initiatives in schools. Acting as a catalyst, this can help to get the issue of seatbelt wearing and the safety benefits which that brings up the agenda. I'm aware that there are a raft of measures going on across the country to help alleviate risks in the school run, such as reduced speed limits around schools, safer routes to school programmes and bicycle safety training for pupils. The measures in the bill and better practice in getting pupils to wear seatbelts can make a vital contribution to these efforts. Extensive dialogue has taken place with local authorities, parenting groups and other stakeholders in relation to guidance, publicity and educational materials. Road Safety Scotland, which produces materials available to every school in Scotland, has also been engaged. There's a wealth of good practice and innovative approaches already happening in Scotland, not least from the councils, which already require seatbelts in all dedicated school transport. And I'm aware that the Scottish Government will be using this as the basis to work with stakeholders and create effective materials and approaches. Councils can and do implement measures such as CCTV to monitor journeys or codes of conduct for pupils and parents to sign. So the requirement to consult with the various school authority sectors and others which Neil Bibby's amendments create will be key to exploring these issues. By setting out the options open to school authorities and highlighting good practice solutions they may want to implement, it will be possible to highlight innovative solutions whilst allowing for tailored solutions. And in all of this, there is one group we must not forget to consult with, the young people themselves. I'm aware the Scottish Government intend to undertake such engagement soon, and it's welcome that Neil Bibby's amendment allows for that. Presiding officer, I support these amendments. Thank you. I call on Neil Bibby to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 3. Thanks, President Officer. And can I thank uh, the Minister and Gillian Martin, who we've been working with uh, on these amendments. As Gillian Martin and uh, John Finney said, we do not have the power um, of enforcement, but we can take measures uh, to promote uh, the use of uh, school seatbelts uh, on, on, on school transport. Um, in terms of uh, Jamie Green's point, in terms of the guidance in Amendment 8, as I said before, it would be to, uh, left to the government in consultation with school authorities, local authorities, to decide how best to encourage the wearing of seatbelts and to use the guidance to cite good examples of the kind of practices and procedure that schools should have uh, in place to do so. Um, so I, um, I wind up and, and press my amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question is Amendment 3. We agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Bibby, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 4. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. call Amendment 5 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Bibby, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 5. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. call Amendment 6 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Bibby, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 7 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Bibby, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 8 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Bibby, move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 2 in the name of Gillian Martin, already debated with Amendment 1. Ms Martin, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed there will be a division. It will be a one-minute decision. Division.
Thank you. Those in favour of the amendment, uh, 67. Those against, 25. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore agreed, and that ends consideration of amendments. And I'll have a short pause before we move on to the debate on the bill. As members will be aware, at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is required, under standing orders, to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. Put briefly, that is whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members, that is, a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision of the Seatbelts and School Transport Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. We'll move, therefore, to the next item of business, and that's a debate on Motion 8706 in the name of Gillian Martin on stage three of the Seatbelts and School Transport Scotland Bill. I'd ask all those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Gillian Martin, the member in charge of the bill, to speak to and move the motion. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Martin. Thank you, presiding officer. It's been a privilege to bring this bill before Parliament and to take forward this important issue to stage three proceedings today. I would like to thank all of those who've contributed in different ways to the legislative scrutiny, but particularly to members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for their detailed consideration and constructive and helpful recommendations. The safety of Scotland's young people is a responsibility that we all share. It transcends party interests and it's been heartening to witness the support from across the political spectrum for these measures. I am particularly grateful to all those who took the time to contribute oral and written evidence to the committee sessions. That input is vital to effective parliamentary scrutiny and it's clear that those in wider society share this chamber's aspirations on these measures. Presiding officer, you'll be aware that this parliament secured competence on this issue through a Scotland Act order. Now we have those powers, I believe we have seen a clear appetite to act on them and implement this legislation just as we know the Welsh Assembly has done on very similar terms. Turning to the detail of the measures before us, there can be few matters more pressing than the protection of Scotland's children and young people. When parents send their, their children off to school every day, they rightly expect that comprehensive measures are in place to keep them safe from harm. And those considerations are not confined within the four walls of the classroom. They exist on journeys to and from school and they exist when youngsters are out on excursions too. That's why the proposals before us today are so important. We know the crucial role that seatbelts can play in a road traffic accident. This has been well established in numerous globally recognised studies. Likewise, as the representative of a rural community, 
I know just how seriously parents and communities take the issue of home to school transport. Some of the distances can be long and the need for supported journeys can be vital. The need to strive for continual improvement is self-evident. Presiding officer, just as teachers and education providers take action every day to keep young people safe, those of us in elected positions also have to play our part. Our influence over lawmaking and policy setting is just as key. Additionally, I've seen for myself just how responsible school pupils can be and how they embrace measures to encourage them to buckle up. From my visit to the fantastic Cookin Primary School in Midlothian, way back at the introduction of this bill, to my visits to schools across my constituency, I've been impressed and energised by the brilliant attitude of pupils towards road safety initiatives. And I'm sure that members are aware that the endeavours in this bill align with public feedback on the matter. What I have heard loud and clear through this bill's pro progress is that people want it to happen and that they're surprised that the law isn't already in place. This has been echoed from stakeholders at committee sessions to members of the public that I have spoken to, even as early on as today on Twitter when we knew this bill was being read. Far away from the Hollywood bubble. Indeed, a national consultation by the Scottish Government in 2016 showed respondents overwhelmingly thought these measures would contribute to road safety. Presiding officer, local government itself has shared these sentiments. Councils have seen the importance of ensuring seatbelts are required in contracts. We know that at least 24 councils already do this on some or all of their contracts, and this will have risen to 24 by the start of the next school year. It's very welcome that we've seen school authorities preparing for this legislation. But I want to ensure it becomes universal across all school authorities as a matter of law, future-proofing so that good practice does not come and go. The Chamber will be aware that the legal duty in the bill covers local authorities, grant-aided school providers and independent school providers. It includes home-to-school provision and following my stage two amendment also includes vehicles used for school trips and excursions. Again, I thank members who expressed their views on that matter. Yes, I will. Edward Mountain. Sorry, I just want to try and push a wee bit on the financial implications. Uh, you, you, you stated that councils, 24 councils already have seatbelts on it, and you've stated that the amendment to ensure that school to uh, activities buses will, will now have to have seatbelts on it, is there a financial cost in either of those? Because that was never brought before the committee, and I wondered if you could clarify it, because it still remains unclear to me. Can I remind members to always speak through the chair, please? I'm sorry, Gillian Martin. Martin. There's been a revised financial memorandum that's taken into account <coughs> all the measures that were taken at stage two, and all the, the, the consultation around uh, the, the, the differences that the, the, the committee actually wanted to be implemented in year, and they're quite evident in the revised financial memorandum. In terms of vehicles, it will include taxis, minibuses, coaches and buses. Some of these are already covered by existing UK laws requiring seatbelts. In general, it is the larger and often older coaches and buses where changes will be required and that the bill is fundamentally aimed at. However, as members who have followed this bill will be acutely aware, one thing which jumps out about school transport is, in Scotland, is how varied the delivery is. There's no uniform approach, no one-size-fits-all formula for organisations. There are around 2,500 schools in the country spread across a diverse range of geographies within our nation's local authorities. We are therefore looking at everything from pupils on double-decker buses going to school in a busy urban centre to children in more rural areas such as Aberdeenshire, my, my, where my constituency is, travelling long distances on coaches on higher speed country roads. That's why flexibility is needed and the bill has been drafted to allow for this. From leaving options open in relation to additional support needs pupils to allowing for the use of adjustable straps, booster seats, lap belts for smaller children. We heard during committee evidence of the varied and innovative measures school authorities use to help with the issue of seatbelt wearing. From bus monitors to behavioural codes to CTTV, the bill again leaves the door open in this regard. And through guidance and publicity, the Scottish Government has pledged to offer ideas and examples of best practice. 
school authorities will be able to utilise this to tailor the best approaches for the individual needs. On another matter, and this may answer Edward Mountain's earlier comment, I am aware that the issue of costs has been a salient point throughout parliamentary scrutiny. I think the Minister for Transport and Islands will outline the Scottish Government's recent actions in more detail. However, members will be aware that a supplementary financial memorandum was tabled. This adds a review clause, altering the headline costs from 8.9 million down to 3.83 million before any further financial support is automatically released. Presiding officer, this again shows how Parliament has helped to influence these final proposals. As such, I urge members to support the seatbelts of School Transport Scotland Bill for the benefit of young people across the country, and I move the motion in my name. I now call Hamza Yousaf. Um, up to six minutes, please, Minister, and I'd appreciate brevity. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. As Parliament will be aware, the Scottish Government supports this important and very worthy bill to keep our young people safe on the journey to school. Like Ms Martin, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the committee for their very considered uh, and detailed uh, scrutiny. Uh, I'd also like to thank stakeholders who gave their view to our public consultation, who have also played a crucial role. Their endeavours have gone a long way in aiding us as parliamentarians, and it is right that they are noted. As has been said already many times in this chamber, this government uh, will never be complacent when it comes to road safety. That's why we're taking forward a whole raft, raft of initiatives as we move towards the ambitious casualty reduction targets that we've set ourselves. But there can be no group where these efforts should be more acutely focused than, of course, our young people. And the measures in this bill will go a long way to strengthening the comprehensive packages, package of measures to keep them safe on the school run and, indeed, of course, now on the excursions away from the classroom. Now, thankfully, travel on buses and coaches for children is comparatively safe. However, the statistics still do show young people uh, are uh, sometimes still being injured, and it's right that we bolster uh, our approach. Now, additionally, the safety benefits of seatbelts is, as Ms Martin says, undisputed. Uh, presenting officer, as I said out in uh, exchanges during the amendments uh, earlier, the Section 30 order process devolving the powers which this bill takes forward give us, has given us ample time for dialogue and consultation. As such, engagement and co-production have been the very hallmarks of this government's approach to formulating the measures. It has been a belt and braces approach, and I've been very encouraged to see Ms Martin taking that foundation and moving, moving it forward. She should be commended for the work, and the detailed work that she has put in, but also the engagement uh, that she has taken around the country uh, and, and, and the very detailed consideration uh, that she has given uh, this bill. The seat belt on school transport working group brought together representatives such as parenting and education groups and local government, uh, but also bus operators too. And as uh, Gillian Martin has already pointed out, dedicated school transport provision uh, is something of a patchwork uh, picture. Uh, our preemptive dialogue with experts in the field allowed us to structure and refine measures so that we could introduce a clearly focused bill and Parliament has uh, built uh, on that. In terms of some of the costs and, and, and the conversation and around the costs, um, of course, the financial forecasts uh, have also been scrutinised uh, by the Parliamentary Committee. And of course, we welcome uh, that scrutiny. I think it's helped us to have a sharper focus. I should point out that the costing exercise for this bill, however, did follow a robust and established new burden process for calculating the financial implications of statutory duties on local authorities. Uh, this has now been put in place to ensure councils are not left out of pocket, and we all know local government is not immune from the challenging backdrop around public finances. This new burden approach uh, has been used for uh, other pieces of legislation, such as the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act in 2013 uh, and the Carer Scotland Act 2016. However, since stage two, we have re-engaged with local government uh, and submitted a supplementary financial memorandum that goes back to the scrutiny uh, of the committee. Uh, there are always, of course, challenges with forecasting cost estimates over a significant number of years. Uh, given the original forecast covered a 14-year period, uh, which accounted for two uh, home-to-school contract cycles, this document now contains a review clause after one contract cycle. The traditional new burden approach for local government uh, finance does not involve the continuation of funding after local government stops incurring costs as a consequence of new legal duties. As such, the Scottish Government intends to review this in 2023, altering, therefore, the headline figure from 8.9 million down to 3.83 million without further evidence 
of incurred cost. It should be noted that when taken as an annual figure, uh, this equates to just under 24,000 when divided by 32 councils. Now, of course, in practice, uh, this will not be the model for administrating distribution uh, of those funds. Uh, it provides, though, an illustrative example of division uh, at a local level. In terms of uh, the guidance, uh, presiding uh, officer, there's currently no legal requirement that children between the ages of three and 14 wear seatbelts where they're fitted on buses and coaches. This is a reserved area uh, of competence. The UK government had previously indicated a desire to transpose relevant elements of the EU directive, which would create such a law. Uh, during the committee scrutiny process, I wrote to UK ministers seeking formal clarification of any timescale for implementation. We hear uh, that there are currently uh, no fixed plans. However, the bill does represent a good opportunity to promote successful approaches to ensuring children wear seatbelts and to raise wider awareness uh, of this issue. Extensive dialogue has taken place, as I have said, with local authorities, parenting groups, uh, and indeed other stakeholders. This will, con be, this, will con uh, this will continue, of course, as we develop guidance and awareness raising campaigns accompanying any final act. Uh, these will be created following consultation uh, with school authorities, but importantly, as Ms. Martin has already said, uh, with young people themselves. Uh, it will be shaped by the legal requirements Mr. Bibby's amendments have added today. Uh, Presiding officer, I believe this bill successfully takes forward the devolved powers we secured on this issue. I hope that all of us in this chamber agree to pass it today. The Scottish Government supports this bill and supports Ms. Martin's motion. <coughs> Call Jamie Green. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, may I open uh, with a brief apology to the Chamber uh, over the, perhaps the initial confusion at the uh, initial uh, amendment. I'm pleased to say we were happy to vote uh, for the amendment that kept, kept us on our toes and perhaps got some MSPs out of their offices to listen to this very interesting debate and participating in it, whereas they may not have done before. Indeed, it was a cunning plan on my behalf. Um, I do welcome the opportunity to open for my benches on this debate. I've participated in the very sessions in the Rural Economy Committee over this. And I should stay from, from the outset uh, uh, and congratulate Gillian Martin for the constructive approach that she's taken with the committee and all parties to get this bill into uh, the place that it's in today. I have absolutely no doubt that as a new member navigating through the legislative process has not been an easy one, uh, so she should be proud of that achievement. Uh, we will, of course, be voting for this bill today. Uh, we believe that it will help improve the safety uh, of children travelling on school transport. Uh, one of the early uh, comments we made on this was uh, that the in in initial incarnation of the bill only applied to commuting to and from the place of school. Uh, we felt very strongly that it should also include uh, school trips, and I'm very pleased to see that that has been included in, in this, uh, this final stage of the bill. Uh, we know around 100,000 uh, school children uh, every day will benefit from this and it is important that the, the availability of seatbelts will go some way towards encouraging good habits in relation to safety on buses. I also commend Labour for its additional work in strengthening this bill uh, with their amendment on the production of guidance. I think that was a, a, a valid and wise introduction to the, uh, to the bill and we were pleased to support that and equally pleased to see the government accept that today too. Um, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents and also the first group uh, which operate a number of bus services uh, agreed uh, in their uh, written consultations to the committee um, uh, and I, I was very pleased to see that this garnered wide support from not just industry but also many third sectors and parents and schools themselves. Um, I'd like to draw attention to a quote from Inspect uh, Inspector Ed Grant Edward of Tayside Police who uh, during a uh, crackdown on uh, the failure to wear uh, wearing seatbelts, uh, said the following quote in, in the media. He said, it's easy to get the impression that you're traveling safely when you're sitting comfortably inside a moving vehicle. That is an illusion that is instantly shattered if for whatever reason, the vehicle stops sharply. Now, the, uh, wearing, the wearing of seatbelts has been high on the agenda in cars for such a long time, uh, but not on buses. So it's right that we turn our attention to this. On average, 45 children in Scotland uh, were injured uh, whilst on a bus or a coach in the years between 2010 and 2015. Now, that's 45 too many in, in all our eyes. Um, also, the World Health Organization identified uh, that the inclusion of seatbelts uh, reduces the risk of fatalities by 25% and minor injuries by 75%. Um, of course, uh, we are not 
uh, without our concerns uh, entirely in the process. Um, I think it is pertinent that we do turn to the financial uh, memorandum, um, which has been uh, reproduced. Uh, it details uh, a cost of around £765,000 annually as a cost of the bill uh, following the legal commencement uh, of it. Um, I think my first reservation, and I may have expressed this in committee, is that there was uh, at no point in the process uh, were there any guarantees that any money given to local authorities through the uh, COSLA arrangements or existing block arrangements uh, would be guaranteed to be spent on seatbelts. And indeed, there was no guarantees that any of this money would be ring-fenced specifically for the purposes of fitting or retrofitting or future fitting of seatbelts. And that is still a concern that I have, albeit perhaps too late to do anything about it in the legislation itself. Uh, and my second point of concern on the finances was around the 11th hour change to the financial memorandum, uh, which actually leaves us very little time to further scrutinise it um, as we are sitting here at stage three um, in the debate. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think if, there is, if we on these benches have any ambiguity over the numbers, uh, for example, we're yet to get any definitive figure um, on the potential cost liability of, uh, of what would have happened if any con existing contracts had been breached or had to be broken as a result of the legislation. And I really do think that's something uh, that the, um, the, the, the bill team in general uh, should have had more knowledge and sight of. Um, but in closing, despite these obstacles uh, to end in a positive, we will be supporting this bill today. It really is a step in the right direction and it will be fundamental in proving uh, the safety of uh, school children on public transport. It is a clear example of what Parli Parliament can do when it uses the wide ranging powers that it's been given at its disposal. And this legislation truly will help uh, the lives of Scots across our country. So uh, I do thank Julie Martin for bringing it to us today. Thank you. I call Neil Bibby around five minutes, please, Mr. Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by thanking Julie Martin for her efforts in steering uh, this bill uh, through Parliament and her willingness to work uh, with other members across the political divide. Um, I think we'd all want to thank uh, the committee for its endeavours as well and, and scrutiny and of course recognise the sterling work of committee clerk Spice and other staff members who as usual do all the heavy lifting uh, that goes unseen. I acknowledge that uh, this is perhaps a modest bill as I said at stage one I would prefer something uh, more substantial and wide ranging but there are a number of factors that mitigate against this not least of which uh, are that key elements remain reserved. That said, the bill will make an important contribution to the safety of our children, and we can never uh, minimise or diminish anything that does that. In a sense, like others, I should declare an interest. I'm a father of two young uh, children, and that has given me a heightened focus uh, and awareness of everything child-related, particularly in relation to safety. As Jamie Green said at stage one, the information suggested that uh, just 45 children per year are injured um, on school buses and coaches. But as I've said pre previously, any injury that brings harm to a child is an injury too many. Now, I recognise that fitting seatbelts to school transport may not eliminate uh, that risk entirely, but it is very much a step in the right direction. This bill has been improved with the consideration and adoption of amendments at stage two and stage three. In particular, uh, like Jamie Green, I do welcome that transport used for school trips must now have seat belts fitted. This is the right thing to do, given the significant number of such journeys every year. Now, it's all very well having a law that says seat belts must be fitted, but if one, uh, no one actually wears them, there is nothing that can be done about it. I referred previously to the committee's description of secondary pupils as a tough audience to convince to wear seat belts. The 74% of pupils who responded in one school uh, said they were not at all likely or unlikely to wear seat belts mm -hmm. uh, are, I suspect, not untypical. As with other social changes, whether it's smoking in public places or use of mobile phones when driving, change can take a while, but once accepted, it becomes the norm. We still have some way to go with the wearing of seat belts on buses, not just amongst children. I've been on coaches where seat belts are fitted and was astonished at just how few passengers actually wore them. Uh, adult passengers should be setting the example, not just for their own safety, but for that of their children and grandchildren. And we need to educate and encourage children to wear seat belts. Uh, and my amendments will hopefully uh, address this. However, while education, encouragement and examples 
of adults uh, are critical. It's not enough just to leave it to choice. Those responsible for the provision of school transport need to face up to their responsibility. This issue, the issue uh, is a reserve matter, and as the Minister said at stage one, the Minister said he has pursued this and the matter of compulsion with the UK Government again. And can I uh, just urge the Minister not to give up on this uh, and to formally keep formally pressing uh, the UK Government again? And I would welcome uh, the publication of his letter and any responses that he has received. I think that would be helpful. Um, like other members, I do have concerns about the financial implications of implementation. Uh, we cannot step back from uh, doing uh, the right thing, and the Scottish Government must work with local authorities to ensure uh, that the costs associated with implementation are, are met. Uh, while I do worry about any delay in implementation, I commend the flexibility advocated uh, by Gillian Martin to try and minimise any unnecessary costs of breaking contracts that would uh, that early implementation would involve. Uh, in closing, presiding officer, Labour is pleased to support this bill. This parliament can take some small but important steps towards improved safety in school transport for our children. And I therefore have a pleasure in recommending the bill to parliament. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, like uh, Neil Bibby, let me congratulate uh, Gillian Martin on both bringing forward this bill but getting it to this stage where I think we may now reasonably anticipate that it will be passed uh, later today. Um, bringing a bill forward is no small matter. Uh, I have uh, taken five bills through uh, Parliament thus far, uh, but not as a private member's bill. Uh, not as a member's bill, uh, where you have to do so much of the work yourself. As a government minister, the four bills I took forward in that capacity, I had this vast team doing all the heavy lifting for me. And uh, when uh, I brought forward a committee bill in the, in the last session, again, the team of clerks were doing the work. But for a member bringing forward a bill, uh, the burden is substantially greater and the reach of understanding and attention to detail that is required is quite substantial. So Gillian deserves very substantial thanks indeed. There is also one uh, part of the system that hasn't got any mention so far, which I think it's proper to mention, and that is actually the Public Petitions Committee. Because over a very long period of time, and there have been considerable number of petitions brought forward considered in great detail. UK government ministers have appeared in front of the Public Petitions Committee on the matters which are in the general area that we're dealing with uh, here uh, today. Uh, so that committee has played a very significant part in uh, digging the soil, uh, putting the manure in there uh, where the crop that we harvest today uh, has grown. Now, Travelling in any vehicle of any kind which is fitted uh, with a seatbelt and not using it is rather like jumping out of a plane without a parachute. It's briefly exciting, but ultimately disastrous. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, the one thing that we are unable to do uh, is, of course, enforcement of wearing. And like others, I travelled on a bus and of that age, uh, I think I'm now on my fourth bus pass. That's how old I've now got. Um, I actually don't recall ever being on a bus where anyone bar myself has been wearing a seatbelt. I just don't think uh, that that's been the case. Now, I, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, colleagues at Westminster for providing us with the powers to do what we're doing today. That is very welcome and that's good cross-parliamentary working. It would be half a nice if they just found the time and the method uh, to create enforcement. By all means, it, th this is not a Scottish issue. I think if enforcement were present uh, in the terms of uh, you're required to wear a seatbelt, the vehicle you're travelling in has a seatbelt. It's that simple. That's all you need to say. That would be of equal benefit to people right across the United Kingdom, and I encourage 
uh, colleagues of whatever political persuasion or whatever government uh, to consider whether they might consider doing that uh, at Westminster. Then they would be catching up with what Wales has done, uh, what we expect to do this afternoon. Uh, briefly and finally, uh, presiding officer, um, we've had a wee bit of a debate about costs. Well, yes, this is so trivial. I'm not prepared to join that particular debate. In matters of safety, we just do it, presiding officer, and I will be delighted to press my button at five o'clock to just do it. Well done, Gillian Barton. Edward Mountain, followed by Daniel Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you, presiding officer. I'm delighted that the school seatbelt, sorry, the seatbelts on school transport bill has commanded support from all parties and is widely supported by parents across Scotland. I have to say, when this matter first came forward, I was rather shocked to discover that the law didn't already exist and that children went to school without wearing seatbelts. I think I, like many parents, believe that when we say goodbye to our children and let them go on the bus, that they would fit their seatbelts as they did in the car when we took them to school. I therefore believe the bill is entirely necessary and voting for it today is the right thing to do. And therefore, I'd like to welcome the fact that Gillian Martin has brought it forward and I also commend her for doing so. I'd also like to welcome the fact that the Scottish Government, through the Minister, has said that he is going to work on ensuring that seatbelts are fitted as soon as possible. And I do urge him to do that. <coughs> I do remain deeply uncomfortable with the amendment, uh, which allows an exception to be made to the original implementation date for secondary school pupils to the 30, from the 31st of December 2018 to 2022. When this bill passes, as I believe it does, I believe it is morally unacceptable for some bus companies who have entered into contracts with local authorities the day before the bill pass gets royal assent not to have seatbelts fitted in their buses till the 31st of August 2021. And I would ask them to reflect on whether they think that is acceptable and whether they agree with me that it is morally unacceptable and make urgent steps to get seatbelts fitted. If this isn't just a minor technical detail, it means that some secondary pupils will be going without the safety option of wearing seatbelts till 2021. I feel strongly and I would ask people to reflect and those when meeting bus companies and bus operators in their constituencies who provide transport urge them to consider this. This is no time to drag our feet on this matter and I will be supporting the bill. I would like to make one other comment. I have found it particularly difficult during the process of this bill to follow the financial memorandum and the financial costings. I do believe, like Mr Stevenson, that when it comes to the safety of children, it is important. That is why we voted against the amendment. But I must say that during the course of this bill, I, I wish we had found ways, which we would have done if the memorandum had come earlier, to ring fence the money, as Mr. Green has said, to actually fitting seatbelts on school transport, because that three point, I think it is 3.83 million, would go a long way to providing seatbelts on every school bus. Now, presiding officer, you said you appreciated brevity. So in closing, along with the parents and people of Scotland, I welcome the seatbelts on school transport bill and I will vote to support it. I do remain deeply saddened that some school secondary pupils will not have the option to wear a seatbelt on school transport till 2021, but I do believe we've taken a huge step forward. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, thank you, Mr Mountain, and those who have um, applied brevity. Uh, as these things happen, I now have a couple of minutes in hand. Um, just warning everyone so that Gillian doesn't have to spend 15 minutes summing up at the end. <laughs> so I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Finney. Well, thank you, presiding officer. And, and, and sort of on that note, um, this is an excellent bill. It's an excellent proposition, but I have one complaint. It's kind of difficult to fill four minutes on it because here's my thought process when I was thinking about this debate. Children are good. Seat belts are good. Therefore, children on minibuses wearing seat belts, good. And at that point, I almost feel like sitting down, but don't worry, presiding officer, I won't. Um, I, I, 
I, I'll try and waffle on for a little bit longer, and I might even take some of uh, uh, Mr. Mountain's uh, time. Uh, too. Excuse me, interrupting you, Mr. Johnson. Can I say it's not acceptable for a front bench to be empty uh, when someone is making a speech? Uh, so, could I ask that someone in the SNP group sorts this immediately? Well. And, and, and can I say at that point, having been a, a colleague of uh, Claire Anderson's on Standards Committee, I think it's long over. Sorry, Mr. Speech. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're desperate to get talking, but I would suggest um, that people weren't really listening because they were a wee bit surprised. So if you would like to start again, I'd appreciate that. Well, I, I, I hold my humour in great regard, but I, even I don't think that many of my jokes bear telling twice especially in this place. Um, but, but I'll certainly uh, see how we go. I, I would like to pay uh, thanks to Gillian Martin. I think it's worth noting this is the first member's bill to come before this place. And I think she's done an excellent job uh, bringing it forward. Uh, uh, you know, I think this is, as I said at the very outset, this is fundamentally a very good idea. I think she is absolutely right in her opening remark. Say this is fundamentally about child protection. And I think it is only fitting that the first member's bill to be brought forward addresses such an important point. But also for me, and on a very personal note, uh, uh, Gillian Martin is a, a colleague on, on the Education Committee, and one that I have quite constructive and positive dialogue. We don't always end up uh, you know, making our arguments on the same side on, in every debate, but it, it is a great pleasure for me to be able to support so warmly uh, the proposition that she's brought forward, and I hope that doesn't sound sycophantic. Uh, but but uh, the other point is, as someone who is just at the early stages of bringing forward a member's bill, and, and very much reflecting Stuart Stevenson's point, that I recognise the huge amount of work that goes into a bill like this, not just on behalf of the member, but their staff, uh, the various other groups that, 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 that support the bill, and it is a huge effort to get here. So I think we should acknowledge that work of all the people that have worked on this bill uh, and have worked with you. But it, it also touches on personal experience. As you know, Neil Bibby and others have pointed out, as a parent, this is hugely important. You know, it's the first thing practically I do once I get out of the house. I've got the children in the car and making sure that those seat belts are on. You know, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I don't have the benefit of being a parent, so I don't know the answer to the question I'm going to address to the member, presiding officer. Um, has the member worked out how to persuade uh, his 14-year-old offspring that when they are out of sight of and parental control that they should always wear a seat belt on any vehicle they're traveling in that has one or is this something that eludes the member as i suspect it eludes most of us daniel johnson well presiding officer um can i please put it on the official record and reassure my wife that i don't have a 14 year old child <laughs> But I think the member raises an excellent point and, and one that I'd like to come to later on. But I think fundamentally, I think that we must take forward this bill and build on it to make sure that we do exactly that. Because there is obviously an issue and a gap in the law. And I think the, the points that have been raised by other members about the work that should be carried forward, both working uh, with governments in other places, but also just in terms of the other things that we can do to ensure that people don't just have seat belts, but wear them, are of fundamental importance. And I think this really brings me on to the next point that I was wanting to make, because I, I recognise very much that when, when I was a child, that it wasn't the law that you had to wear the seatbelt at all. I, I'm old enough to remember when the law came in, in uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, certainly in 1989, in terms of requiring ch uh, children to wear seatbelts, and indeed 1991, when rear seatbelts were wearing, and big, indeed I think the original law in terms of adults wearing uh, seatbelts in cars was 1982. Uh, so we've come a long way, but, but we need to do an awful lot more. But it's not just about the law, it's also about culture and behavior. And I think one of the things that, that I reflected on from thinking about this debate is, you know, very often we make changes in the law in response to tragic incidents and events. And in some ways, I think maybe the thing we have to thank Jim and Martin most is that that's not the circumstances we're in. We're actually getting ahead of those things. We've got an opportunity here today and one that it, we are going to take to actually preempt such a, a tragic incident. And that, that is very important. And it's also very important because I think that we also need to reflect, since we're in this situation... Wind up, please, Mr Johnson. Winding up. 
quickly. Yeah. I will. I just, I've lost track of how much time I had. That's understandable. Indeed. Um, and so I think this is very much catching up. But I think just on the points that other members have raised, I think we shouldn't be use the law as a set of instructions. I think one of the things that we must seek to do is move further and faster than the law. But this isn't prescriptive, and we must encourage local authorities to go further. And finally, we must work with, uh, with authorities in other places because there are still too many exemptions and loopholes, especially around older vehicles, and we should get rid of those as far as we can. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, President Officer. Um, my colleague Stuart Stevenson alluded to the uh, Petitions Committee and the role it played in this, and I think it's, uh, the background to this bill, of course, was a, a, a petition on the 9th of November 2007 brought by Lynn Merrifield on behalf of King's Seat Community Council. And I'm sure they'll reflect on the value, or hopefully I'm sure, they will reflect on the value of this building, a lawmaking building. And the important thing is that we make good law, and we make good law by scrutinising and scrutinising intensely. So uh, as, a, as a member of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I'm grateful for the comments that have been made. There was a lot of scrutiny went into this bill, and uh, no apology for that. Um, I think that's appropriate. Um, good too that in... 2015, we uh, got the power to bring forward this. Disappointing, of course, that we don't have the power to compel um, an enforcement that is reserved to the UK. So I was happy to hear comments about that from Neil Bibby, indeed more of that from Labour, because we are fettered, and that's another example when we are fettered. Um, and, and it caused me to reflect on what, what the role of this building is in other ways. I mean, community safety is extremely important. Child protection is extremely important. And there is a role for the state in that. And we all have our roles and responsibilities for that. It's the UK government, the Scottish government, local authorities, schools, par parents groups, or indeed individuals. And uh, um, by passing this tonight, we'll send a very clear message. Because, of course, a requirement in any organisation is to assess risk and put in place measures to address the risk. And I think it's significant that many members have said that, and indeed this is reflected by the general public, that people thought that this was the law anyway. Oh, but it were. So we're, we, I, I said in speaking to one of the amendments, it's not an ideal world we live in. And that's manifest itself in some of the areas of concerns that people had around this bill, which were the financial matters. Because, of course, I was very concerned that what we were doing was rewarding failure so that the authorities that had acted uh, diligently on this weren't going to be uh, re recipients of... Of, of money and, and, and others uh, maybe. But I, I think there's been a balance struck. It is a, a pragmatic approach that's been taken. Now, uh, some of you may know I was a, a police officer for 30 years and uh, during that time um, saw many improvements. I saw design improvements in, in respect of uh, vehicles, road engineering, um, and, and of course the, the wearing of seat belts. The biggest change was driver behaviour. Um, and um, that shapes everything. So the amendments that the, the Scottish Labour Party brought forward, initially at stage two by uh, colleague uh, Rhoda Grant and uh, today by Neil Wibby, are very welcome because this is about um, sending a very clear message about the role that education plays in this. And we should lead by example. And like Stuart Stevenson, I was recently on a coach and surprised to see uh, um, that I, I was also the only person wearing a seatbelt. Um, We've seen changes. Uh, with, um, uh, another example uh, is the wearing of seat belts, and uh, as, as I think Daniel Johnson alluded to, the fairly recent change of smoking in, in vehicles and the realisation that that has an impact uh, on children. So that was a piece of members' legislation that uh, was passed in this parliament in the last session. And um, I hope that another safety measure, namely my, my colleague Mark Ruskell's 20 mile an hour um, uh, uh, proposal will, will gain support in the in the uh, chamber when it comes if it gets that far indeed um, we, we must see an increased use in public transport there's a decline in bus numbers this morning I was at Alexander Dennis they're acutely aware of that they want innovative design to encourage young people to be the future bus users uh, um, they're going to do that at first and foremost whilst at school they remain safe on the buses and that buses are a pleasant place to, to, to occupy. So there's a lot of thought going into design and that. And um, it's all going to count for nothing if at this stage we, we don't ensure that young people wear the, the seatbelts. So I commend the good work that Gillian Martin's put into this and uh, the Scottish Green Party will be lending, happy to lend their support tonight. Thank you. The last contribution to the open... Oh, sorry. Oh, terribly sorry. I nearly forgot about Gail Ross. How could I? So I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Gail Ross. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
Uh, I too congratulate Gillian Martin for bringing forward this bill and for seeing it through to this stage. This is all about uh, the safety of our children on school transport. And as Gillian Martin said, and others have as well, and I absolutely agree when I've spoken to parents about this, most people think this is already the law. It isn't. It's not in place, but it will be soon thanks to Gillian Martin's efforts today and in the months preceding this. Um, the committee has worked really well um, together during stages one and two, just as a committee should work together well under the able convenership of Edward Mountain. Um, amendments were made to improve the bill. Uh, I'm not normally noted for that. But, um, sorry, said into a position from the uh, comment from the minister I overheard. So, so I would say that um, sensible amendments were made uh, during a stage two, such as already referred to school trips were included, not just the home to school and back again. I think that was very important. Um, but I have to say that when the committee took evidence on this bill at stage one, we were initially told that there were only about 100 buses that currently transported children to and from school that were not fitted with seat belts. But that all of our councils, all of our councils, were making very good progress to ensure that all our school transport would indeed be fitted with seat belts very soon. Therefore, this led to question about whether this bill was necessary at all. And I think I even I asked that question. If every council was implementing this already, why was the bill necessary? Well, it is necessary because we've just found out at this late stage at stage three that there are still five councils that will not be doing this now until 2021. Being polite, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is only what I can call a very poor show from these five councils. We're talking about child safety on our school transport here. Um, this is not news to those councils. This is argument has been going on for years, even before Gillian Martin presented her bill. And I would have thought the moral thing to do, and, I, and here we are passing legislation, it's already been mentioned, but we're passing legislation to make sure and enforce the law by 2021 that these are done. I would call on those companies providing transport to our secondary school children that we have just exempted in the law to 2021. Don't wait for the law to force you to do it. Do it now or as soon as you possibly can. Yes, of course. Jamie Green. Uh, I, I'm intrigued uh, by the member's comments that safety is paramount. If that's the case, why did his party support the amendment that would delay the introduction of secondary schools? Mike Rumbles. We supported it because we thought it was a sensible approach for the law to be doing that. What I'm saying is, actually, there are two elements here. There's the law which you are making now, but there's a moral obligation that people have. And we can't just excuse people because the law says they must do it by 2021. I am calling for them to do it now or as soon as they can practically do it and their budget and balance books allow them to do it. Don't wait till the law forces them to do it in 2021. Now, the only upside of that, that it does indeed show that this bill is actually necessary to make sure it happens. And again, I congratulate Gillian Martin for bringing it forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, I can confirm that the Liberal Democrats fully support this bill, and I thought we were right to do that because of the financial issues that were still outstanding, uh, supporting Gillian Martin's amendment. And we will be voting for this bill. But I just want to end by saying, this doesn't absolve those bus companies from their moral responsibility to do the right thing and do it now before 2021. I do now come to the last of the open debate speeches, and that's Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Gillian Martin has come a long way since her first appearance at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to, ans to answer the first set of questions um, that we put to her about the proposed bill and we broadly welcomed the introduction of the bill and we noted the positive responses from all the stakeholders that gave evidence both in person at the committee and also in their written responses and I would also like to thank her, her team and everyone that took part in all the evidence sessions as well. And some did question the need for a bill if a lot of the local authorities were already doing it. There was 18 at the time, we hear now that 24 have taken this step. 
It's good news, but still a lot more to do. Um, as has been mentioned, we asked why the bill only covered dedicated home to school transport, but not school trips. And I'm glad to say that this has been taken on board and addressed in an amendment at stage two. And we did feel that it was a glaring anomaly that schools were being asked to provide seatbelts on one journey, but not on others. The Scottish Government has provided funding for the fitting of seatbelts, both retrospectively and in future. And the REC Committee did challenge these costs. And now a supplementary financial memorandum has been produced, which lowers the headline costs from £8.9 million to £3.83 million. And we have since learned that five local authorities with contracts already in place were facing financial burdens. And it is the right thing to do not to break these contracts but I am finding myself in agreement with a lot of people across this chamber. Uh, Rhoda Grant made the point about local authorities and the government open a dialogue with the bus companies. And I also find myself agreeing with Mike Grumbles that they do have a moral responsibility. I don't often admit that, but I'm quite happy to do so today. <laughs> Although the law on seatbelt wearing is still reserved to Westminster, uh, Gillian Martin's member's bill proposes to introduce legislation to ensure that all dedicated school transport ve vehicles and those used for school trips are fitted with seat belts. And as Daniel Johnston has already said as well, when I was a child, I took a bus to and from school every day and there were no seat belts on them either. And there were no seat belts on the backs of cars then either. But over time and with changes to legislation, we have come to realize what an essential part of traveling safely they are. And when I get in a car, I also make sure that the first thing I do if my son is with me is to make sure that he puts on a seatbelt. It's automatic. We need to get children into the habit of doing so. And the aim is to make this the first thing that kids do on a bus as well. Awareness, education and reinforcement. They need to know that being safe is cool and seatbelts keep you safe. But that is a big question. How do schools and local authorities ensure that once the seatbelts are fitted, they are actually used? And I welcome the amendment from Neil Bibby um, on a reporting duty on local authorities. I think that's very important. And it's, it's, it's good to reflect that in one of our evidence sessions, the Scottish Youth Parliament gave a powerful account from young people themselves. And they've advised that the guidance should be prepared with young people and that they need to have ownership of this, whether it's bus monitors, mentorships, educational events. And there are many schemes already in place uh, at schools all over the country that are very successful and these should also be looked at. Um, in the policy objective to the bill, it stated that over the period 2010 to 2015, an average of 42 children were slightly injured while traveling by bus or coach in Scotland each year, with a further three children per year seriously injured. No children were killed while traveling on buses or coaches during this period. And I think Neil Bibby and Jamie Green mentioned it, and they're entirely correct that one child injured is one child too many. Presiding officer, this is a safety measure that is nothing more than common sense. Uh, my first question, like many other people, to Gillian Martin when she told me that this bill was coming forward was, doesn't this already happen? I've supported this bill since it was brought to committee. And as a government, a parliament and a society, we owe it to our young people. Presiding officer, the fact that we are now here debating stage three of this bill in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament is a very proud moment. And I want to thank Gillian Martin for all her hard work on this. Having seatbelts on school transport is vital, keeps our children safe. So, so from parents and young people across Scotland, thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Rhoda Grant. Four minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, this has been a good debate with a lot of consensus. Um, and I also want to join colleagues in congratulating Gillian Martin for bringing forward the bill. Um, while having the support of government officials, which is always helpful, it's still really challenging to bring a bill forward. There was a reasonable amount of consensus around the issue, but the technicalities of any bill can lose you support. And her handling of this ensured that that wasn't the case. Can I also take time to thank the clerks and support staff in the committee who worked with as well, and also those who give evidence as we put the bill through the committee process. 
Um, I also want to thank Jamie Green for facing up to getting all our colleagues into the chamber early. I think it provided us with some amusement. Not sure they're going to be so forgiving. And also, can I thank Daniel Johnston for not repeating his jokes, even at your ins <laughs> insistence. So uh, oh, oh, that's all the thanks I want to make tonight and maybe turn to the bill more seriously. Um, Scottish Labour has always supported the bill throughout because we have a duty of care to our young people and their safety while in the care of the state must be paramount. Neil Bibby and others um, talked about um, the reserve powers about wearing seat belts. So while this bill is about fitting seat belts onto school transport, it does nothing to enforce wearing them. Implementation of the EU directive and adoption of this into UK law would make wearing seat belts mandatory as well. So I hope that happens and, and join with Neil in calling on the government to continue their efforts with the UK government to make that the case. But Neil's amendments today will help change the culture and ensure that seat belts are worn. But without these powers, um, we only have the powers of persuasion of young people. Daniel Johnston talked about a parent's duty to ensure um, their children were wearing seat belts and um, to get that point across to them. And hopefully that then um, is replicated when children are in local authority care. We need to persuade young people to wear them. And this will require education at an early stage to encourage children and young people to do that, but also encourage them to do it going forward into adulthood. And I think Gail Ross made the point that the Youth Parliament had made to us um, that was really important to get young people involved in drawing up those guidelines and encouraging others. Um, and John Finney's right in saying that we all have a role to play in that to change the culture. It's important that councils have time to plan for the changes that could increase costs and um, certain, uh, certainty about the contribution of those costs that might come from central government. And many councils seeing the benefits of seatbelt wearing have already taken the step and paid for it out of their own funds and no one can disagree with that position. Gillian Martin's amendment today ensured that none would have to break contracts and uh, incur additional costs because councils are underfunded and this is impacting on council services. So we have to be very sure that we don't impose more cuts on them, but we continue obviously to push for fairer funding. Yep. Mike Rumbles. I'm in absolute agreement with you that having given the exemption to 2021 for these councils that so we don't break the contracts, but would you agree that there is now a moral duty on those people providing the transport to do something about this. Rhoda Grant. I, I absolutely agree with Mike Rumbles on that point. I think he said in his own speech, he'd do it now, and I would want to echo um, that sentiment. And I also welcome the minister agreeing to do what he can to bring pressure to bear on those companies so that we get this in place as early as possible. Edward Mountain talked about ring fencing the money attached to the bill for those who had not implemented seat belts on school buses and were in those contracts. But that actually punishes those who had good practice and made this a priority for themselves. So all councils are under pressure and I think we need to find ways of rewarding those who have good practice um, while encouraging others to follow suit. A presiding officer, you're giving me the, the evil eye that says I've run out of time. <laughs> but but I, I, want to, I want to welcome this bill and confirm that we will be supporting it tonight and hopefully it goes a long way to making school travel and school trips more, much more safe for our young people. I call Peter Grant, four minutes. Peter. Sorry, I'm now marrying Peter Chapman to Rhoda Grant. Sorry about that. Peter Chapman, four minutes, please. <clears throat> There's enough scandals already, presiding <laughs> officer. Presiding officer, it is impossible to be against this bill. It is a simple and focused bill that legally requires seat belts to be fitted to all dedicated home to school buses and school trip buses in Scotland. And Gillian Martin deserves thanks and credit for bringing it forward. I am pleased at my amendment at stage two that these seatbelt provisions are put in place by the end of 2018 for secondary school pupils was agreed at stage two. The original intention was that this legislation would come into effect for primary schools from 2018, but secondary schools would have to wait until 2021. 
And I could see no valid reason for this delay and for secondary school children to be put at risk for longer than necessary. I accept that Gillian Martin has modified that to some extent today with her amendment, but I expect there will only be a very limited number of contracts to which this will apply and that the vast majority of children will be covered by the end of 2018. And I also accept Mike Rumbles' point that the companies involved that haven't put seatbelts in, in place by that time, there is a moral duty on them to think twice. This bill requires seatbelts to be fitted to school buses, but there are difficulties in persuading young folks to wear them. In evidence, it was highlighted that older pupils in particular were cynical about the wearing of seatbelts in school transport, with one young respondent even stating, no one puts seatbelts on in my school bus as it's uncool. And if the driver comes round and tells people to wear them, they just get taken off again. Now, the consultation, uh, as, as Neil Bibby said, found that 74% of young people were not at all likely or unlikely to wear seatbelts. How, but however, as First Bus has said, if this issue is tackled correctly, we will have an opportunity to educate children and explain to them the benefits of seatbelts and the need to use them. We hope that common sense will prevail and that youngsters recognize the wearing of seatbelts is sensible and that it will eventually become second nature. And again, I would say Neil Bibby's uh, amendments today will help in that process, and I thank him for that. Another matter of importance that ought to be confronted is the type of belt that is fitted. There are issues with the shoulder type three point belts which are inappropriate and unsafe for children who are aged under 12 years old and those who are under 135 centimeters tall. And it appears that booster seats would be required in some cases. Now it is clear that discussions must take place between local authorities and bus operators regarding the most suitable type of belts to be fitted. And this is out with the scope of the bill, but nevertheless, it is a detail that needs to be addressed. A further anomaly is the fact that children who are traveling to school on service buses that are open to fair paying passengers will not be covered, as, a, as there is no requirement for those, bu those buses to have seat belts fitted. But we believe that this option of using service buses needs to remain because it is the most cost effective option in built up areas and can reduce congestion and pollution levels. However, the youngsters who use them will not have the same levels of protection on their way to school as kids who use other bus types. Given that 18 local authorities have already fitted seatbelts on their school fleets and that others are in the process of doing so, the process is already taking place regardless of the bell, and I welcome that. But in closing, presiding officer, I will say again that this is a good bell. The safety of children going to and from school is incredibly important and we support this bill going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Um, call Hamza Youssef. Uh, up to five minutes, please, Minister. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. It's been encouraging to hear the strength of feeling in the chamber today uh, on these measures to keep our school people safe. I remember uh, the feeling when I was appointed Transport Minister the first time I received an email uh, as Transport Ministers do about fatality on our trunk roads. And it was really quite stark at the detail uh, and that really, uh, you know, it weighs down on you quite uh, heavily, as it did then and as it does now whenever I receive one of those emails. So there can be no greater uh, responsibility for any government than the safety of our, our citizens and, of course, more acutely, the safety of our young people. So it's been very encouraging to hear that, obviously, the consensual nature of the debate, but more than the consensus, what's been encouraging uh, has been uh, the... Uh, of course, scrutiny uh, and the constructive scrutiny that the committee, uh, members across the chamber and external stakeholders have placed in around uh, this uh, bill. I want to thank, of course, Gillian Martin for bringing it forward. Uh, she's rightly been commended for doing so as a new member, not an easy thing to bring forward uh, a member's bill, but also she's rightly uh, thanked uh, Transport Scotland officials and other officials behind the scenes uh, who, who, who do a power of work to, I should say, the often unfairly maligned Transport Scotland, uh, who do a great power of work. Uh, generally speaking, as well. Um, I can hear some laughing from this. It's deeply unfair. Uh, can I say that um, I thought uh, many good points were, were made, and I'll just try to pick up on some of them uh, in my closing uh, remarks. I thought Daniel Johnson's very salient point that uh, uh, 
Too often, law can be made, legislation can be passed as a knee-jerk to an incident or knee-jerk to a reaction, and in some respects, uh, rightly lauding uh, everybody actually in this parliament uh, for being ahead of the curve uh, in, in that respect. Uh, notwithstanding that, of course, everybody else, many people saying in their contributions that they were initially surprised that this wasn't law, as many people in the public uh, most certainly are. So important that uh, this law uh, is, is being uh, passed. Um, the Scottish Government, uh, of course, will continue to take forward a raft of measures uh, to improve safety in our roads and indeed safety uh, amongst uh, children. Uh, you know, people often ask me, how do we make our roads safer? safer? There is not one silver bullet, of course there, there isn't. Uh, there are a range and a, a suite uh, package of measures that help uh, to keep our roads safe. In terms of children, uh, we can think of 20 mile per hour limits uh, near our schools. Uh, we know about supporting the Safer Routes to School programme. Fund the funding of bikeability, uh, which is bike training, of course, for young people. Uh, all of these uh, help to keep uh, our children uh, safe. Um, as I said, delighted to see this bill uh, hopefully pass, of course, at uh, decision time uh, today. Um, important that Stuart Stevenson gave us the context and uh, in, in, in only the way that Stuart Stevenson can uh, around this bill, particularly that the issue germinated the, the, uh, the germination of this at the, the Public Petitions Committee. I think that's important to put that uh, on, on the record. Um, right the way through to the government taking forward uh, the devolution of the power, uh, of course, to the member herself picking up the mantle and introducing the bill uh, we see uh, before us. In terms of the scrutiny, there were some points, I think, that were addressed, to, to, uh, uh, some questions that were asked of me, which I'll try to address uh, in these closing uh, couple of minutes uh, that uh, I have. Uh, Neil Bibby requested um, that I continue to push the UK government on enforcement. Of course, uh, if this bill passes, as uh, of course we all assume it will, uh, I will do that on the back of this bill. Uh, I think he asked me to publish the letters, of course. Of course, I would be happy uh, to do that as well. Of course, I would. Edward Mountain. Uh, Minister, I'm very grateful for you giving way. And uh, uh, the reason for my intervention is, is that we have heard uh, cross-party support so far on the moral obligation on bus companies that might be exempted due to the uh, amendment that's been agreed. Uh, for secondary transport taking the date through to 2021, 20, a moral obligation on those companies to consider seatbelts. Would you join uh, the Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives uh, and the Labour Party and say that you and your government believe there's a moral obligation on, on bus operators to, to bring the fitting of seatbelts forward if they can? A little yeah, yes, extra I, time I, if you I need it, Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, yes, I have no problem associating myself uh, with, with those remarks. I was going to come... Uh, to that very uh, point indeed. I think I already said in my earlier remarks that I would take uh, Rhoda Grant uh, up on uh, her suggestion that the government perhaps should bring uh, the players uh, together with local authorities, uh, the contractors, and see if we can find a, a way forward that doesn't have to wait till 2021. 20, uh, but I'm in, in agreement with, with, with uh, uh, Mr Rumbles. I think we all agreed with Mike Rumbles at one point, which is a dangerous place to be, I have to say, in this parliament. But uh, uh, on this point, a very salient point that he made, that there's a moral obligation there when it comes to our, our, our young people's uh, safety. But there's also, of course, on the other hand, the practicality of the law. So you can separate the legal obligation and the moral obligation. And in terms of Mr Mountain's question on the moral obligation, uh, I, I stand with him and others across the chamber in that regard. I wanted to address Mr Mountain's point also on the financial memorandum. I accept what he says in relation to the fact that this information would be much more helpful at stage two. So uh, let me reflect on that for any future uh, pieces of legislation uh, that we take. I thought uh, the final point to, to finish on, and I know the time constraints, uh, presiding officer, were, were the ones that Gillian Martin made, that consultation on future guidance, uh, consultation uh, on, on how to, to best uh, take this bill forward. Uh, we must not forget our young people and all of this. So, of course, school authorities, parent uh, educational uh, committees uh, as well, but uh, young people really uh, at the heart uh, of that. And I suppose the final, final point uh, I wanted to make was uh, once again an agreement uh, with uh, Mike Rumbles. He once asked me during the uh, sc uh, parliamentary scrutiny, the committee scrutiny on this, uh, what do we need this bill? Uh, and the reasons why also we need it uh, is not just that legal and moral obligation, but actually we have to future proof it. Even, even if all 32 local authorities had it in their contracts, uh, for however lo long those contracts were, that wouldn't give the legal future proofing. So I think it's very, very important that this bill will, will future proof it, proof it uh, for the future as well. So, uh, President Officer, we are strapped in, ready to go if Parliament sees fit to pass these measures before us to do it. Uh, the Government backs this bill, and of course, I urge the rest of the Chamber to do the same.
I call Gillian Martin to close the debate. You have six minutes, please, Ms Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as always in this chamber, it's been um, an interesting debate, but as is not often happens, an extremely consensual debate, a hugely constructive one. And I want to thank everyone who's spoken today. And that, that's, it's, been, uh, it's been, for me, a very special afternoon. And thank you for your all con contributing. Um, but before, I want to talk about the speakers and, and some of the points that were made, but before I do, I absolutely have to thank uh, Brendan, Gavin and Anne and everyone in, in Transport Scotland and the Bills team who got me through this. Uh, I couldn't have done it without it, and I particularly have to mention my parliamentary assistant, Judith, who knows more about seatbelts than she ever thought possible. Um, I don't know how happy she is about that, but you know, if it ends up being a question and a quiz show and she wins a million dollars or whatever, even when she goes back to California, she'll have me to thank, so that's fine. Um, I want to point to Jamie Green. Um, I thought was it something that, that Jamie Green uh, quoted came from uh, Inspector Edward, uh, Grant Edward of Tayside Police, was something that I think I'll, I'll always remember now that there is an illusion of safety. In a fast, when you're in a fast-moving vehicle. Um, and, and I want to thank him for, for including that quote in his speech because I think it's something that I'll, I'll, I'll remember. Um, Neil Bibby talked about collaborating across the political divide. And, and one thing I would say is that anyone's thinking about doing a, a member's bill like I have, it's, it's actually been one of the, the best things about this process is that you, you really have to go out with your political party comfort zone and actually start really speaking to people and getting people on side regardless of your own political parties. And it's been invaluable. I think I've met so many more people in a, a you know, a, 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 a more... Um, less than but just passing people in the corridor and I know you a lot better and that's been, been a good thing. But he, he mentioned as well about um, being a dad as well and, and so did Gail, Gail Ross mentioned about being a mum and I think that that's what it comes down to for a lot of us. It's about safety of our kids and you should always just, you, you have that in the back of your mind when you do something like this. And that was my, you know, really propelled me forward in this because my kids... Um, were on buses that had seatbelts throughout their whole school life and I wanted to be able to give that peace of mind to other parents that didn't have local authorities who, who had those measures in place. Yes, I will. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I wonder if the member might also acknowledge that grandfathers such as my late constituency Ron Beatty, who campaigned uh, tirelessly uh, for, for safety on school buses uh, also have a role and Ron was a big, big hearted character who we miss enormously. Gillian Martin. I, I had the privilege to, to meet uh, Ron Beatty just at the point when I was coming onto stage one and I'm very grateful for the chance because unfortunately Mr Beatty is no longer with us and he was he just came along to wish me luck. I really thought he was going to give me a hard time that I wasn't doing more. I was expecting that. But he didn't. He just said, go on, get it done. And the words of Stuart Stevenson, just do it, uh, perhaps. Um, Edward Mountain, um, I, I agree that buses, that, uh, that companies that already have contracts in place that don't have seatbelts should, I hope they've been listening today. And, um, there's other bus companies as well that are doing the right thing, and I think that they would want their, their, their fellow bus companies to, to do the same. Daniel Johnson, um, been told... Oh, you're about to intervene in me. Yes. Daniel Johnson. It only costs £50 to buy an inertial real seatbelt. That's all we're asking these bus companies to spend. And I wonder if the member would agree with me who would just say to those bus companies, just spend that money. Gillian Martin. Yeah, got no argument from me, but I, um, and, and, I, and I agree. The bus companies don't have seatbelts in place and they're putting them out for contract for school journeys. They really need to take a look at themselves and their actual moral responsibility. I was going to mention uh, Daniel Johnson um, because Daniel Johnson been told to repeat himself will live in my memory is one of the most bizarre things that's happened today. I think enjoy that moment. I uh, should enjoy that moment. Um, and, and him and Gail Ross talked of a time where they remember being, as children, there wasn't even seatbelts in the backs of cars. There wasn't even that, that legal duty to put the seatbelts on. And that's something that shows how far we've come. 
John Finney, um, I want to thank John uh, for, for a lot of his advice. I had some chats with John throughout this whole process. And for mentioning Lynn Merrifield um, of the Kingston Community Council, who actually first brought this to the public uh, petitions committee. Um, without her, we maybe wouldn't be in this situation today. I also want to mention that there is an EU directive to compel people to wear seatbelts that could be enacted by the UK government. And I think if anyone mentioned that today, that they were worried that people wouldn't put seatbelts on, can I ask you all to write to your MPs and see if we can get this passed before Brexit, please? And then we won't have a situation where we're having to cajole people into wearing their seatbelts. Um, Mike Rumbles, my goodness, yet again, I'm agreeing with Mike Rumbles. It's becoming a bit of a habit. Um, I wonder how long that'll last. And then I've got my colleagues here. I won't milk it. Um, but he called on companies to do the right thing. And he's absolutely right. Do the right thing. Don't put your buses out if they don't have seatbelts when you've got kids in them. And I think that was absolute, an absolute, you know, a moment that I'll, I'll remember you saying that because you, you are absolutely right. I'll stop now because it's getting ridiculous. Um, but uh, I, just, I just want to, to, to end, if I've got time, I don't know how much time I have, looking at the presiding officer. If I could finish there just by thanking for everyone for all the help that they've given me in this process. Thank you very much. And that concludes the stage three debate on the seatbelt and school transport Scotland bill. And we go straight to decision time. The first question is that motion 8600 in the name of Alison Harris on the Writers to the Signet Dependence Annuity Fund Amendment Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the final question is that motion 8706 in the name of Gillian Martin on stage three of the Seatbelts and School Transport Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Oh, sorry. That's good, but we're going to have to, have a, we're going to, have to actually have a division on this. So... Uh, so the question is that we agree or disagree to the motion in the name of Gillian Martin. Can you press your buttons now? The result of the vote on motion 8706 in the name of Julian Martin is yes, 102, no, zero, abstentions, zero. The motion is therefore agreed and the seat belts, seat belts on School Transport Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you. That concludes decision time.